series on the Wisconsin idea, past and present. This lecture series is part of a course being taught under the auspices of the Department of Sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. My name is Gwen Drury, and I'm substituting this evening for Professor Eric Sandgren of the School of Veterinary Medicine, who is serving as the instructor for the course this semester. Students taking this for credit, I need to remind you to sign in, please. The Wisconsin idea has always been about more than training students for the workforce. It meant, as Adelaide Stevenson once put it, a faith in the application of intelligence and reason to the problems of society. The aspiration to light the way of Wisconsin citizens and government with the best torches of knowledge and understanding that their university can provide. Accordingly, this lecture series and the course with which it is associated aim to bring students, staff, and faculty in the UW system into a broad conversation with the citizens of the state about how the knowledge produced at the University of Wisconsin has benefited the public in the past and continues to do so today. We encourage you to participate actively through our course website, www.wiscidea.com. There you'll find the readings for each week and the video recordings of each week's lecture. The sociology department is offering this course with limited resources. If you would like to contribute to this project, please consider making a contribution to the Wisconsin IDEA course fund. Please contact the sociology department to do so. The focus of this evening's talk, which will take the form of interviews, is on Wisconsinites who pursue a grand challenge that everyone thought was impossible, but through their hard work, refusal to give up, ability to share their compelling vision and get people involved in the project, they were able to do it. At some point in their process, in their process, um, these Wisconsinites initiated a partnership with the University of Wisconsin to access knowledge resources and other support that help them turn their impossible dream into a breathtaking accomplishment and to change the future for many others to follow. Like all of the speakers in this course, tonight's guests are donating their time free of charge out of a commitment to public service. Tonight we'll be talking about Sturgeon and the Wisconsin idea. Isn't that what you think about every day? Sturgeon and the Wisconsin idea. Um, Bill Casper, right here, um, is from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, where he grew up, and also where he founded a group called Sturgeon for Tomorrow. Though it started out as a small group of amazing Wisconsinites, it's now a cast of thousands of amazing Wisconsinites, all pulling together to achieve an unbelievable result. Joining him is Kathleen Schmidt-Klein of the Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute here at UW-Madison. She is co-author of a book entitled People of the Sturgeon. Here's the book. <laughs> people of the Sturgeon, Wisconsin's Love Affair with an Ancient Fish that tells the story of many different people's involvement with Wisconsin's dinosaur fish, and you can bet that Bill makes an appearance in that book. So please join me in welcoming them. Okay, so now we have to figure out how the, mic, the mics are gonna go so that we don't conflict. Um, could, if the two of you share, that'd be great. Okay, kind of an interesting way to do it, but that's okay. So, what I'd like to start off with is a question to our Wisconsinite. We're all Wisconsinites, but to our main Wisconsinite tonight. Um, Bill, what was the goal that you decided to pursue, and why did you decide to do it? I knew you'd ask that. <laughs> um, I'm not familiar. I'm, I'm not sure if all of you people know about sturgeon spearing on Lake Winnebago. But anyway, uh, I've been at that for a long time. I started going out on a lake since I was eight years old. Not spearing, I just sit with my uncle. And when I was 14, he gave me his fishing shanty. and said, you're old enough to go by yourself. So he gave me all his gear, and that's how I got started. And jumping ahead, that was in 1938 when I started, 39. And um, later years, after the service and this and that fishing. Anyway, I got to worrying about the sturgeon in the lake. I've been reading different things about it, that there was we had no knowledge at all on how to raise sturgeon. The DNR had no, the DNR had tried it, 
They were unsuccessful. Michigan tried it. They were unsuccessful. So anyway, I thought, what if something happened to this crop of sturgeon in Lake Winnebago? I didn't know what I was thinking of, but something could happen. Because we were the only lake, uh, we were the only lake in the uh, whole United States, really, that had sturgeon. And there were a few in the Great Lakes yet, but everything got cut off. All the spawning got cut off with the sturgeon. When um, my great-grandparents and perhaps a lot of yours came over here from Europe or wherever, and they needed hydroelectric dams, they needed water wheels, they needed, they were starting farming. This is just over 200 years ago. So they built a dam in every river that fed into the Great Lakes. Anything that was big enough, any stream or whatever was big enough to run a water wheel. And amazingly enough, the same thing was happening over in Europe in the Volga River. The Russians were building hydroelectric dams and cut off the sturgeon from the Caspian Sea that was where the sturgeon went to spawn. So anyway, I'm thinking about, we don't know how to raise sturgeon. I guess that was the question. Yeah. So anyway, what I did was, I left the lake a little early that year, and I had a bulletin printed telling the fishermen that I was gonna have a meeting at our town hall and just, I, I took the, for any of you that know how big Lake Winnebago is, I had enough bulletins printed so I could put one in every tavern around the lake. <laughs> and anyway, try that sometime, because you usually have to have a little beer, you know. <laughs> anyway, I got home, and when I had the meeting, uh, 150 surgeon fishermen showed up. And um, I also invited two people from the Department of Natural Resources. So I got up in front, not knowing, absolutely not knowing what I was talking about. And I just said that we really loved going sturgeon fishing, all the people that were there. And I said, we should learn how to rep reproduce these fish because if something ever happened to Winnebago, this would be over with. I mean, there, were, there was just the end of the story. So fishermen all agreed, believe me. It was amazing, the support I got. But there was two people there from the Department of Natural Resources who got up and started telling us we didn't know what we we're talking about, and it went on into the evening. Quite a hassle, but anyway, we left it at that. I had people come forward that said, we're gonna help you, and we'll form a, an organization. Didn't know what the name of it, had no name for it, but articles were written in the newspaper because of because I had a newspaper invited also. I wanted to get a little publicity on this thing. So anyway, newspaper guy called me or, and he said we should call it SOS, Save Our Sturgeon. And I said, no, I don't want And we have Ducks Unlimited, so if some thought Sturgeon Unlimited. Well, I got a call from my uncle, a different uncle, brother to the one that took me fishing. He was a retired priest, Catholic priest. I mean, you, you can't do better than that. And he said, he said, Bill, I'm reading about you, and you're looking for a, a name. And he said, why don't you just call it Sturgeon for Tomorrow? He said, that's what you're, that's what you're trying to do. So long story short, that's how we got going. Okay, so you just decided that you wanted to 
help the sturgeon reproduce in Lake Winnebago. Right. Okay. Right. And you ended up turning around the sturgeon population so that now there's lots of sturgeon and you're providing them to other places in the country as well. So we'll go, we'll go into that a little bit as well. Um, I would like to ask Kathleen to chime in now. So as you were writing this book, Kathleen, you really were digging into this story and have lots of other people's stories in there as well. What do you think was unusual about this goal that, uh, that Bill came up with? Well, um, learning more, and, and thankfully Bill kept really good records of, of this whole formation of this group, so um, that, that was really helpful in writing this book, and his wife was very important for that too because she kept them all very well organized for me um, when I started going through them. But this was pretty unique, um, and just learning about where the DNR was at this point, um, talking to these DNR uh, 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 employees that the bill is talking about, um, coming from their perspective, they had they felt like they had spent a long time building up the DNR as being a science-based organization, um, that the policy decisions that were being made were based on science. And they felt like they had been working on that really since since the 40s, um, when when uh, it was it was not called the DNR then, but when they started doing scientific studies. And uh, th these fellows, um, they had studied at the university. Um, they had studied under uh, some of the early uh, uh, limnology professors here, um, Burge and, and Jude. Uh, uh, Schneeberger was another fellow from the DNR, so they felt like they they had a um, they had to protect what they had spent all this time building up. So uh, I think to have a bunch of sturgeon spears from Lake Winnebago approach them and say you need to start raising sturgeon, well. They did know the scientific background of that, and they did know that there had been studies going back to the late 1800s of people around the country trying to raise sturgeon, lake sturgeon in, in this case, um, in the hatchery, and they had all failed. So a lot of people had tried because sturgeon are, they're very valuable fish. Um, they're, they were valuable for their meat, but they were also valuable because they produce caviar. Um, and that's another reason why they were severely overfished um, in this country and others as well. Um, so they knew that, that people had tried to do this and had failed. Um, so, and they also, uh, when I interviewed them, said that the other thing that they were worried about was that um, they were fairly confident that the population of Lake Sturgeon in Lake Winnebago was, was fairly stable and healthy enough to be able to um, allow spears to keep harvesting them. They were a little worried that if uh, the state of Wisconsin started doing studies to start stocking the lake, that uh, the federal government might step in and say, well, that must mean that the population is endangered and, and we need to stop the, the spearing season. Um, so. That was just interesting to hear um, where the DNR, based on where they were coming from with their history, but then to talk to Bill and uh, for him to be sitting out there on the ice reading this this brochure from the DNR wondering, well, do they really know how many sturgeon are, <laughs> are in the lake and what if they don't? And Bill also had the, the knowledge of other things that were going on in the lake because he, he grew up there. Um, he lived there his whole life, and he knew that there was still illegal activity going on with, with sturgeon, that there was still poaching going on. Uh, there were still people spearing without tags, um, spearing illegally. So it was a little unclear what exactly was the harvest every year. Um, so Bill was genuinely worried about the population, and knowing that nobody knew how to raise these fish and stock them, um, if some calamity did happen, he was right. It, it was. It was. It could be a very dire thing. And and Bill's right. The sturgeon fishery in in Lake Winnebago is like none else in in the country. Um, it is. It is a very uh, large population of lake sturgeon, the largest in this country. 
And uh, there's no other sort of spearing season like this in the country. So it's a very unique thing, and it's a unique part of the culture around Lake Winnebago that goes back to the Native Americans who, who lived here before anybody settled in Wisconsin. So um, it's a very important culture, and, uh, and it was interesting to learn about those two perspectives of you know the, the state agency coming from their perspective, but then the people growing up around this resource uh, who felt very invested in it, what their perspective was too. Thanks. Um, so Bill, how did you, uh, you, you had this intimate knowledge of the lake itself and of the people who lived around it for so many years, and especially of the sturgeon fishermen. Um, we know how you got the sturgeon fishermen involved. You went to the taverns and put up the signs, and that worked. Mm -hmm. um, and you invited these two DNR guys. But how did you get people involved who knew, who actually did know how to raise sturgeon? Well, after many newspaper articles, I, I can't, Kathy, Kathy has the newspaper articles. But anyway, the word really got out what was, what we had in mind. And a fellow that I didn't know at all, his name was Walter Lang, Reverend Walter Lang, Lutheran, Catholic, both on my side. <laughs> anyway, Reverend Walter Lang lives in New London, and he called me one day and he said, Bill, I got a pamphlet for his trout farm. And he said, there's a little article in there about a fellow in, out east at Lake Champlain and at Dartmouth College. And he's been going to Russia studying sturgeon. And he said, maybe I ought to find him, you know. So, wow, I got on the phone. <laughs> call information. Pre-internet, right? Pre-internet, <laughs> believe me. 41 years ago. And I, I called Dartmouth College. And a little gal answered the phone. She said, you know, we're closed. I said, well, it doesn't matter. I'm just looking for how to get a hold of Professor Bill Ballard. And she said, would you believe He's walking past my window right now. <laughs> and she said, if I, if I uh, call his, uh, I'll bring his number. And she said, I know he's going to answer. So anyway, I, call, I talked to him. He was real quiet for a while, and I'm telling him about Sturgeon in Lake Winnebago. And he said, Lake Winnebago, he wasn't quite sure where it was at. And I, and he, I said, it's in Wisconsin. And I said, if you look at a map, it's the biggest lake inside of the boundaries of Wisconsin. And so he said, my God, man, first of all, he said, where, where are you calling from? And I told him that, that it was Lake Winnebago, Wisconsin. And then we had sturgeon. And I said, I hear you worked on sturgeon, at least went to Russia. And he said, I went to Russia, Romania. I go wherever I can find a fish, he said. And we got him right here. He said, of all things, he did not know we had sturgeon. <laughs> so, and he said, they just finally learned in Russia and learned how to raise the sturgeon. And it took him 15 years. And what had happened in, in Russia, as I probably said, uh, they build a hydroelectric dam, and a sturgeon, the only way they can reproduce is swim from a lake, spawn up a river. It's just the way they are. And uh, this enormous hydroelectric dam shut off the sturgeon. Well, they had free fishing because millions of fish would come up as far as that dam. And uh, Russian people even had a ship, he told me. They built a big ship. It was like totally built out of porcelain, and it was a fish factory. And they could take the fish out and 
they'd butcher them. They'd take the black eggs because the females were headed up the river because their eggs were black, as they have to be for caviar. So they take the eggs, they process the meat, they could do it all on this big ship, he said. And suddenly they realize after so many years that the population of fish was going down. They weren't able to reproduce. And they got into a real panic situation and thought, we, we gotta learn how to raise sturgeon. And Ballard told me it took 15 years to solve the problem. The problem being in the DNR of Wisconsin learned the same thing, was that the eggs of a sturgeon female are very adhesive. And when they lay their eggs in the river, the way this picture shows you, a female will be spawning and maybe five males will gather around her following and you can actually hear them drum. The sound, you should go to Wild Rose or to Shyocton on the Wolf River and see the fish. But anyway, the eggs will go down, they're fertilized because the males will drop their milt as, as they're doing their thing. And anyway, the eye of a, the egg, the egg itself of a sturgeon is like an eye. And when one cell from the male touches that, it'll close and it'll drop down and, and adhere to rocks in the river. So fish and crayfish and everything else is looking for eating sturgeon eggs. And so this is how they're reproduced. But when they tried doing this in a hatchery, putting the uh, adhesive eggs into a, I forget the name of the jar, it's, a, it's got a special name. But anyway, the hatcheries have a jar about this big and they put the sturgeon eggs in there feed water in it so it just barely goes over the top. The eggs can't get out, but it just rolls the eggs constantly. And, but the eggs would all stick together. They had adhered together. And so, absolutely could not, they would, they would get a fungus in them and they were unsuccessful in raising fish. So anyway, just scientists in Russia, just by a stroke of luck, Ballard was there at the right time. She found that if you took red clay, like we have fields of it here, most of you, if you have a garden and you have red clay, you surely know what it's like. Is it called bentonite? Bentonite. bentonite. Scientific name, I never knew. But it's, uh, but anyway, she put water in, in a big porcelain dish pan, like your ma used when you were a kid, and put water in there, put the little stir, uh, uh, bentonite in there and stirred it up, made a real fine slurry, and she dumped some eggs in there after they were fertilized, and she rolled them around and took them out and rinsed them, put them into this jar for hatching, and they hatched. They didn't stick together, and Ballard was there at the right time to find us, and we were just like absolutely lucky, as you can imagine. So he said, if you got eggs, we can raise sturgeon. So I said, what do I have to do to get you here to talk to the DNR? Is that they're driving me up the wall? <laughs> so anyway, he said it'll take a plane ticket for me and my wife. So a friend of mine that was one of these directors, his name is Bob Blank, he said, he came along and told me, he said, Bill, I'm gonna give you a thousand bucks because we didn't have any money. We were just all talk and, and know nothing. <laughs> and, and so Bob says, I'll give you a thousand dollars. You bring this guy out here and, and you take care of calling the DNR, I called Madison and I told him, I said, get as many 
people as you can to come to Fond du Lac a certain day. I got them the Holiday Inn, had a meeting, and Ballard and his wife flew in, stayed at that very Holiday Inn. And so he talked to us and talked and talked and argued. And finally, a gentleman named Jim Addis said, all right, if you can come up with, I mean, a multitude of questions, if you can answer all these things that has to be done, approval from the state, this, you have to do it all. And I thought, oh man, we're never gonna be able to do all this. Well, meeting broke up, took Ballard to dinner, took him back, he and his wife to the Holiday Inn, and the next morning, very, very early, I had to pick him up, take him to the airport. And he found, he walked, he walked up to me and he said, can you find that recipe? He said, can you find, or, or he said, I, I, I wrote this recipe, I wrote this request, he said, of what the DNR was insisting on, and I thought it would take months to do this. And his wife says, yes, he stayed up. He stayed up all night, and anyway, I took a picture, we took a picture, or Kathy did, of this very recipe that he wrote. It was on a piece of yellow, uh, what do you call this paper thing? You know, legal pad, like, like a legal pad. When he walked out of his room and handed this to me, and he said, now guard this with your life. He says, I, it, I've been up all night, and he did this. So DNR was very surprised that I would have all this information practically the next morning. And uh, from there on, they said, go ahead, give it a shot, and we, and we did that. So I don't mean to ramble on, but sorry. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you another question, so you'll have to keep talking if that's okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so the next question is, um, there was another gentleman who actually works um, at the Sea Grant Institute, but he's at UW-Milwaukee, is that correct? Named Fred Binkowski, oh. who got involved. That's where the university came in, and he got yeah. involved at some point. So up until this point, the university is not involved, right? right. It's the DNR and the Fishers right there. Yeah. Um, however, for about the last 40 years, there has been an active sturgeon research program at the university, mm -hmm. and can you tell us the story of how Fred got involved? Oh, Fred got... Fred got involved. He works at the Great Lakes Center. It's now called the School of Freshwater Sciences at okay. UW Milwaukee. Okay. I don't know if y'all heard I don't know if y'all heard that, but anyway we had to go ahead. The first time we're trying to raise sturgeon, we put them well the first time didn't pan out at all. They tried they tried doing it at a, at a little fish hatchery, it didn't pan out. But anyway, the next year, the DNR said, well, well, we'll take this right to the state hatchery at Wild Rose, and we'll, we'll try it. And Bill Ballard, Dartmouth, he got on a plane and he flew, he kept in contact with me all the time, and he, I said, well, there, we've got eggs, we're gonna start. They're going to try it, and he got on a plane, and he was there before they even got started on it. They did the very same thing. He stayed in the hatchery. He he slept in the hatchery on a cot, and he always his his wife said he he ate rye bread and cheese. He said, but he wouldn't leave. And and so anyway, would you believe that the first hatching that was in the hatchery, we had 90 some percent success. So if you imagine you have this jar, let's say you got a quart of eggs and you dump it in this big jar and it's rolling with eggs. And when they hatch, these little tiny fingerlings, not even fingerlings, they're fried like they're tiny. 
They have no eyes, no mouth, no fins, nothing. They're just wiggling. But under their belly is a little egg yolk. And the fish digest that into their system. And in about 11 days or so, they, they develop their eyes and their gills and their fins, and then they start looking for food. Up until that time, they can live on that egg yolk. So, I don't know if I answered what you asked. I'm well, sorry. Uh, no, I, can, I can continue, though, if you want. Do that, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they come out, and, and once that yolk is depleted, like Bill said, they're looking for food, and that was the next trick. So the, the first trick was figuring out how not to make them clump together and get this fungus and just die even before they hatch. But the second trick was, well, what do baby sturgeon eat? And nobody knew. Nobody had any idea. So they, they tried the regular commercial feed that a lot of other types of Great Lakes fish eat, and sturgeon, they would have none of it. They were So that's what Fred really, um, Fred Binkowski, um, and I work with him at Sea Grant, and, and he's a, a scientist at the School of Freshwater Sciences at, at UW-Milwaukee. Um, so Fred, uh, the DNR, gave some of the, the eggs to Fred as well to take to his lab in Milwaukee to see what he could make of them as well. And he had a very good um, uh, success hatching them as well. But then he started this study to try and figure out what they would eat. And he just described all these different types of things that he tried. And so finally it ended up being little tiny brine shrimp um, that they wanted to eat, which is very, yeah, with krill, which is very expensive to feed a, a hatchery raised fish, but that's all the sturgeon wanted. He said it was like they saw somebody put down, you know, some ground beef and they were like, Pleh. but then somebody put down that T bone and they were like, oh, yeah, that's what we want. Um, so Fred, Fred, uh, his early uh, studies into what the young sturgeon wanted to eat were very important for making this this uh, being able to raise sturgeon in a hatchery successful. And then um, from then on, once, uh, once the DNR had success at Wild Rose and Fred had success down in Milwaukee, that just launched a lot of, of sturgeon research. And it, it wasn't just important for Wisconsin. There were sturgeon populations around the country, um, people who were trying to figure out how they might be able to rehabilitate uh, populations of sturgeon in the Mississippi River, in the Tennessee River, all over the country. They were calling Bill. They were calling the DNR. They were calling Fred, looking for, you know, how'd you do it? And, and can you give us some eggs? Can you come and tell us uh, what, what we're doing wrong? So um, it was really all launched by, by Bill out on the ice, but really, if, if he hadn't um, really approached the DNR about this, I, I'm not quite sure when the DNR would have decided to do it, and, and probably pro maybe eventually. Sure but, but what the beauty of this project really was, sure, the DNR might have sometime decided to start trying to figure this out, or, or uh, the university might have tried to start figuring this out. But because Bill approached the university and the DNR, uh, this wonderful relationship developed. Um, and so many more things happened because of it than would have happened alone. So one of the things that I talked about um, to the students in the discussion it, um, section is the novel by A.M. Forster, um, Howard's End. And the motto from that, that novel is only connect. And I think that the genius of the things that happened that, that allowed this all to come about was the connection between people. People who normally didn't get to talk to each other, some people who actually had refused to talk to each other. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that was like, bringing um, uh, DNR folks in and oh, uh, hanging yeah. out with the fishermen and that. When this finally got to a point where DNR was very good friends then, Believe me, because if I can go back a bit, we needed money. We, we needed money, and I, of course, had to tell the DNR that the fishermen of Lake Winnebago are going to pay for all of this. You don't need to invest any money. And so what we did, we've, we decided to have a, a banquet 
and we made little bulletins and notified fishermen we're going to have a banquet fundraising thing and we had so many people show up at this hall and we had a dinner set up that well the farmers had to milk their cows first but the people that got there early they got to sit down to eat and when all the rest of them showed up they had to stand all around this hall and wait till these people got up and they sat down well we knew right away this doesn't work but we had a lot of people a lot of people so the next year we went to a bigger hall which is in Keele, Wisconsin. It's quite a ways from my home, but it's a big hall. And we had 560 people showed up. And this year we were getting smart. We had a, a waiting list. We said if you get in early enough, we give you, well, that was all we were allowed to bring in that building, 560 people. So then I called Fond du Lac, I called some friends of mine, and I said, you gotta start a chapter because we can't handle all these people. So they did. The, the, their meetings are held at the Holiday Inn in Fond du Lac. They're loaded. They had more people than they could handle. So a fellow started a chapter up in Appleton. His name, I should remember his name, my God, sorry. But anyway, he had a thousand people showed up and it was unreal for a couple of years and then and then it started backing off a little but then Oshkosh started a chapter and so we were getting money in you know and at Beam Jim Beam some of you know what that is <laughs> whiskey the Badger Liquor and Fine Lake got a hold of me and said if you will let us make a bottle for you with a sturgeon on it, we'll pay you $7.50 for every bottle we sell. And so we, had to, we did that. And the first, we had a mold breaking ceremony because we didn't want somebody to uh, reproduce this thing after Badger Liquor went through all this. It, they gave me a check for $28,000 the first night when we had the banquet for the mold breaking. And believe me, and back in that time, interest rates were good. We had money in the bank. We could start talking smart, you know. But anyway, it was great. It was, it was wonderful. And and so now you've you just surpassed a fundraising mark, and what was that? I'm sorry, fundraising. Yes, that's that's how. And and up till now, after telling the D, the DNR would come every spring in March after sturgeon fishing in March, DNR has a meeting with us to give us their wish list of what we need this year, and one of the early early things of all things was a guy, Kenny Corbin, he's in this book, he's a pilot, and they came to us and they said, we like to fly the river looking for violators, but that plane engine isn't really big enough to fly low, and you know, he said, we, there's a powerful engine out there we could put in. So we gave him, we bought an engine for him in St. Louis, he flew his plane down there and he put a new engine in it. And amazing that we were able to do that. It was one of the early things that we did. But we bought, we bought things for him, like I, I wrote some things down here, because I can't, we, one big thing that we did, the DNR was after me right off the bat, and they said, if you want to do something other than learn to raise sturgeon, why don't you get your fishermen to go up on the Wolf River and patrol the river to keep violating under control. And so we did it. We, at our dinner, we told them, we want to have a sturgeon patrol. This is what the caps look like now. We've been doing that for years. And we have like 300 people sign up. And the DNR will send us a notice as to when so many people can sign up and this and that. and. 
they go up there and sit at the river, sit, sit by the river. I did it once. You sit out by the river all night long trying to watch somebody might come poaching a sturgeon, but anyway, that's how we that's how we got through that thing. But we've bought a lot of stuff. And this past March we gave them one million. We hit uh, They, they passed, brace yourself, they have given over a million dollars to the DNR, yeah. these fishermen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, going back to what Kathy was talking about with these krill, for 10 years, we give the Wild Rose $10,000 a year to buy krill. And we give Fred in Milwaukee 10,000 for 10 years. We just, in fact, send him 10,000 now. And so it's amazing, but. Uh, now you had also told me last time I talked with you yes, um, something about um, Nebraska and sturgeon, oh, sturgeon yeah. in Nebraska. I don't know if you think about sturgeon in Nebraska, but you wanna talk about that a little bit? We got a call from the DNR in um, in St. Louis, and it was um, uh, the guy's name was he was the head of the DNR in that thing in St. Louis, and he would fly up here every spring and get a quart of fertilized eggs, and he by then he knew how to how to uh, how to take care of them, and he would his name is Kim Graham, good friend, and. He, he uh, he called me once and he said, "Bill, you got to just come down here and see your fish." And I said, "Well, I can't, I can't take off of work and go down to Missouri and look at a fish." But anyway, and after he called and he said, "People in the in Nebraska, North Platte River flows across Nebraska," he said, "They're finding these three foot fish, and they don't know what it is. They're calling all over saying what kind of and." The sturgeon eggs that we had given them, and it was it was an amazing story that he would tell. How and now, believe it or not, now they're taking sturgeon from the eggs that we had given them, and they're raising their own. We shipped eggs to Georgia and to Michigan, Minnesota, you name it. I think we've sent eggs and. This past year, uh, we don't like to put any in Lake Winnebago. We do periodically for just radio tagging them and testing. But I lost my train here, honey. That's okay. I, can, <laughs> I can add to that just a little bit. Um, uh, so a lot of the science and the research that Sturgeon for Tomorrow has funded um, throughout the years, it's, it's been put to very good use in Wisconsin to do uh, restoration in other parts, um, not just Lake Winnebago, because that was always in pretty good shape. But uh, throughout the Great Lakes now, there's a lot of sturgeon restoration going on, and a lot of what's been learned in Wisconsin is what's being put to use now throughout the Great Lakes. So things about uh, what, what young sturgeon like to eat, um, habitat studies, where do they like to spawn, um, and uh, so that's been, that's been helpful throughout the Great Lakes. And even the model of sturgeon for tomorrow is spreading now as well. There's been a chapter in Michigan, um, one in New York. In New York. Um, yep. So they are they are taking this this model of citizens who are interested in eventually being able to spear sturgeon as a recreational fishery, uh, but working to conserve them so that there will be healthy populations once again. And just a. a a brief snapshot of what uh, you know what happened throughout the Great Lakes um, in Lake Michigan. They they say that there's probably about one percent of the population that there used to be of lake sturgeon. So they were they were really nearly wiped out in the Great Lakes. Um, so 
things that we've learned in Wisconsin have been very, very important for those restoration efforts. Um, one of the things that um, Charles Van Hise said, if, if you remember my talk at the very beginning of this series, um, as he was formulating the, what he thought in, in terms of the Wisconsin idea, was that he thought that conservation, he defined it as being the greatest good for the greatest number for the longest time. So not don't use anything, don't touch anything, but make sure you have the greatest good for the greatest number for the longest time. So it, this seems like a, a prime example of that. I'd just like to say one thing more, if I can. Before all this took place, and while I'm having this DNR battles, I get a call from DNR guy in Oshkosh, and he said, uh, hey, we're, I'm going to Milwaukee. We're having a meeting. And he said, I'd like to have you ride along. So I would have to leave work and, I mean, not get paid because I'd just go to Milwaukee with him. And he said, hey, the, we're having a little meeting. Well, I got down there, and there was a room almost like this without the taper to it, but it was a room like this. And it was absolutely every DNR person in the state, I think, was there, including all of Madison. And so I sat down in the back, and so a guy started a meeting up front here, and he said, oh, I got this guy here named Bill Casper. He's... Uh, He's got the idea that he's going to learn to raise sturgeon. So, oh, everybody had a big laugh. And this went on and on. And then he said, Bill, why don't you come up? And I had to go up front. And I'm not used to talking, you know, you can tell that. But anyway, I had to go up front and try to explain what we're going to do. And guys were, I mean, I was really catching a lot of grief. So when I get all done with my, what I thought was the spiel about how we got to learn to do this, I did say, and I hope I live long enough to see us put sturgeon back into the Great Lakes. Oh, if you want to hear a roar out of this group, they thought, you're lucky to even learn to raise fish, much stock the Great Lakes. Well, now... <laughs> Fred's doing it. <laughs> Fred and others, yes. Um, yeah, the, and I've never heard that story before, so I'm really glad I got to hear that. <laughs> um, so Kathleen, I wanted to ask you, at what point and how did you get involved and end up writing this book, People of the Sturgeon? Uh, this book came about um, because of this very strong culture around Lake Winnebago, and it was Fred Binkowski and Ron Brook, who uh, has since retired from the DNR, but was uh, basically the, the lead sturgeon um, DNR biologist out of Oshkosh. They came to the Sea Grant Institute and said, we think, you know, we've, we've done all this with sturgeon over the years, and there's so much, there's a lot a uh, lot to tell about this this not just the fish the fish are so neat they're they're the dinosaur fish they've been around for 150 million years they don't spawn until they're in their 20s you have to protect them for a long time um, they're very special fish but there's also a lot of culture um, a, a lot of history um, revolving around this fish and, and we'd like to tell that story um, and so I was a, a new science writer at the Sea Grant Institute, and I said, wow, that sounds really interesting. Um, I would like to help you with that. Um, so I did. I, I, I started working with Ron and Fred, and they took me. I was up at all around Lake Winnebago during spearing season, um, up the Wolf River during spawning season, and just learning about everything um, that has to do with this fish. But uh, we couldn't have written this book without Sturgeon for Tomorrow, actually, because we really needed the personal stories, um, the history of the people, uh, to tell the story. So Sturgeon for Tomorrow um, uh, helped us with doing oral history interviews of Spears um, families around the lake. Uh, we went up to the Menominee Reservation and recorded the history about um, Sturgeon with the, the Menominee tribe. Um, but uh, it was definitely a, a big effort um, with, with Sturgeon for Tomorrow playing a, a big role in it. And, um, and I'm really 
happy that I was able to be a part of it. It really changed my life. <laughs> Thanks. I'm going to ask if we could kind of turn our chairs around so that we can look at these um, different pictures and you can explain what's... These are pictures from the book that have stories behind them. Yeah, I want to see this. This one is an H.H. H. Bennett photo um, from the Wisconsin Historical Society. And uh, what Bill was talking about, those dams in, in Russia, were you talking about? Is that the hydroelectric? Well, this is a, a, a very a more primitive dam on the Wisconsin River near the Dells. Um, so a lot of the rivers in Wisconsin were dammed at one point or another. And um, not only did it prevent sturgeon from being able to run upriver to where they like to spawn, the best habitat for their eggs, but it was a really easy place for people to poach them, to take them. Um, so that is a, is a man standing there with his pitchfork, and he just speared a sturgeon um, that was stuck at that dam right there on the Wisconsin River. <laughs> What's that, Bill? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, these are the eggs. This is what they look like before that gel is removed. That's just how they'd stick together. And that's caviar. And that's caviar, right. And you have to do something. And I need to tell you, I need to tell you this. We had a sturgeon symposium in Oshkosh and Russian people. In fact, is we gave $25,000 to Russia to bring their scientists here because I didn't realize they, these people had no money, but of course, Sturgeon for tomorrow, we get all kinds of money now, you know. <laughs> but anyway, and we paid for any number of scientists to come to Oshkosh, to come to the symposium. It was an international symposium. I forget how many countries, they were all here to see this thing. And, um, oh, yeah, I'm at dinner, one evening, I'm sitting next to a lady from Russia. Couldn't speak any English, but she had an interpreter with her, sat across from me. And, but she opened up a can of caviar, this lady did. Her name was Yulia, Yulia Kim. <laughs> and and she's, she said something about motioning about me eating caviar, and I said, I really had never eaten caviar, believe it or not. And so she showed me how to do this, and you have to learn this if you eat caviar. I had never seen this before. She, she carried a small silver spoon, maybe as long as that, and she went into this dish of caviar, and she put it on top of her two fingers like this. Right there, she laid it on her fingers. And then she had a cracker in her hand, and then she she slurped to me, and she says, "That's the way you know. That's the way to eat caviar." I couldn't believe it, but I had really learned something. <laughs> in case any of you ever eat caviar, that's as I had to do it. Put it on your fingers, slurp it in, and eat a cracker. So, but anyway. Yeah. Right. And this this one has uh, this shows a lot of the rivers and. Oh yeah, I live right where it says pipe, on this side of the lake. I, I live five miles on this side, I live right by the lake. And when I go fishing, most of my years, I go to pipe. We put a row of trees out four miles, and Oshkosh, or, or not Oshkosh, but Wentz on the lake, on the west shore, they put a row of trees out about that far, and we meet out there and it gives so, you a... But when you talk about a row of trees, you're not planting the trees, right? No, no, we put Christmas trees out. All this happens right after Christmas. People throw their trees out, so we, we pick them up. Wagon loads of them. And the ice has to be at least 10 inches before we go out. But it gets thicker, but it gets thinner also. But anyway, uh, that's where I usually go fishing. And... Off a pipe, I can tell all you this. We always keep our secrets, you know, about where to fish. But for years, if I could, I'd go out three miles and south of the road. They always put the road right on that same spot. And I go south of the road, and there's an enormous mud flat out there and red 
red worms that eventually hatch, float up, and they become the lake fly on Lake Winnebago. If you've ever been there, they get all over you and you swallow them and everything else. But I mean, uh, they're great. The sturgeon love that little red worm. So I was thinking of making a t-shirt that said endangered species to put a big lake fly on it. But anyway. This one. Uh, oh, yeah. That, that, that one's in the book. I can't remember the family, but I, I know that it's from it's from the Fond du Lac area, and we had a bunch of people um, donate photos and artifacts uh, for this book, um, and I know that it was taken in 1915, and I know that because uh, well, somebody told me that, but I remember it because um, that's the year that that uh, sturgeon harvest was outlawed in Wisconsin. The the population was getting so low throughout Wisconsin that the Conservation Commission decided to shut down all harvest of sturgeon. Um, but this picture is still there, 1950. <laughs> yeah, that's how the violators work. Yes. Yeah, so this one, I, we were just speaking at dinner because uh, I I had seen online that Bill had been interviewed a couple of years ago for another story, not about sturgeon spearing or was sturgeon for tomorrow, but about. Uh, things that were going on during prohibition around Lake Winnebago. And so he had some bootlegging stories of <laughs> things that were going on. And um, since it was illegal from 1915 to 1932 to harvest sturgeon in Wisconsin, um, that was that that. Uh, there was still illegal harvest going on, and it often was wrapped up in other illegal activities. So this is a, a picture from, I think, up by Tustin. Um, yeah, uh, with some, uh, you know, they're enjoying their hooch, and they've got a bunch of sturgeon in the back there. Um, but yeah, there there was quite a bit of illegal activity going on during that time. I will say that <laughs> we, I got I got a feeling maybe people are taking a sturgeon now and then, but we've really cut down on the sturgeon violating that went on the river. In fact, we have two people that are directors, that while they were in high school, they would, they would violate, they would, they would work for people that had the set lines, they would string a line like a rope. A yeah, a snag line across the river, and they'd have a drop line hanging down with a big hook on it and a, a piece of lead on the end of that, and when a sturgeon would swim by, they'd just get hooked on it. And these kids were running these set lines, and when when they'd get caught, well, they might take the set line and they might give the kid a slap on the hands and say, "Don't do it again." But two of these people are now directors of Sturgeon for tomorrow. So, so they they this is what that line what this is what that line would look like. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing how far how far they would. This is a, I think, I think that, oh, oh, well, that's okay. This is just kind of showing the history of, of sturgeon spearing on Lake Winnebago. And, and, you know, some people ask, well, why, why is it spearing? Why, why are people spearing the fish? And that's the only legal way that there is to take sturgeon out of Lake Winnebago. It's spearing through the ice uh, during two weeks in February, and that's it. Um, and it, it came about because the people living around Lake Winnebago in the 30s wanted to open up a fishery again, and they said, that's the way we want it. We don't want it any other way. We want it through the ice, because that's what they had been doing. That's what their, their parents and grandparents had taught them, and it goes all the way back to Native Americans living in that area. The early French explorers learned it from the Menominee Indians, um, uh, the Native Americans who are spearing fish through the ice. So it's been, it's pretty much the same. The one thing we say that's changed is um, the shanty. <laughs> um, a little bit more comfortable because the Native Americans would lie down on their stomachs on the ice. And that's, and gas stoves, you're right, in the shanties. Uh, but yeah, that, that's the, that's the way historically um, uh, fish were speared through the ice uh, with a blanket over your head. Um, waiting for it to go by yeah and that's that's the evolution that we've had of the the shanty so that's bill casper's shanty he just retired it last year um because it's going to the state historical museum here in madison so it's been donated 
Um, yeah. Well, That's what it looks road. like out on Lake Winnebago. There's the trees. Yeah, there's a row of trees. They're one tenth of a mile apart. So, and then every mile we put an extra tree, so you can always tell them in a big snowstorm. Uh, if you ever get caught out there, and that's that's what it looks like sitting in the shanty. And it has to be dark in the shanty, right? Yeah, the shanty's dark, and and that's how that's how a spear looks, and it has flying barbs on it. When you spear a sturgeon, and you pull it, it'll they will open up. And I must tell you something that happened. If we have a minute. I don't want to run over with this no, one. Anyway, the DNR notified us. It was in the 90s. And they said, we're going to raise, we're going to raise the size limit. We were able to take a sturgeon 45 inches. And if you take a sturgeon under 45 inches, there's about a $1,200 fine on it, so you're trying to be very careful. So the DNR told us, we want to raise this up. And I said, this is a mistake. You can't raise it up any higher. The fact is, you ought to just take the limit right off. And so what I did, and just on my own sort of, one of our banquets, we had 500 and 540 people at the banquet. I just got to open my book because I wrote some things down. But anyway, I had, uh, I circulated a little pen, a little card. They were red. I still have. Yeah. yeah. And, and I just sat on there because I knew people were spearing a fish and they would have been satisfied with it because when the sturgeon comes in, you see it, and you know, you throw the spear and uh, it's too small. Well, you're not going to pay a $1,200 fine, so they throw it back. So I said, if we could just stop that. So what I did, I made this little card, not very big, and I said, don't sign your name on it, and only people that fish, because at our dinners we have husband and wives, and I said, I don't want both of you in the shanty writing the same thing down. So what happened was I had, um, I had the 540 some people there, 314 people voted that night. And what it said on the card was the last season, I only wanted one year in this, said, did you have to throw a sturgeon back because it was undersized? Did you throw one, two, three, or more? So I had some kids circulate these around, and out of the 500 and some, 314 people voted. Now Ron Brooks is sitting right in front of me when we're running this, this thing. And, and anyway, 314 people voted, 70 people said, I speared a fish and I threw it back. Some people speared two fish and threw it back. One little kid came up to me and he said, I didn't, I didn't spear a fish, but my brother did, he said, and he threw it, he had to throw it back. And so I took this information and I went right down by Ron, who's sitting there, and I said, just look, how many fish got killed and thrown back and people were satisfied it would have taken that fish home. And he's got his calculator and he starts in and all of a sudden he called me down there and he said, Bill, you had 500 people at your dinner. We sell over 10,000 tags. We had over 10,000 people go fishing. Now it's up to 12,000. But he says, do you know that if we would take that off, we could probably save 2,000 fish every year. He says, you've got to go to Madison with me. I had to come. I took off work. <laughs> and I came down to Madison with Ron. And, he, and what I did, I, I know I have to talk to the Natural Resources Board. And so I took the head off of my spear, which is like the spear you saw there with the flying. Oh, that's my car, my boat, our boat, our family boat. 
But my spearhead is like that. I just took the head of it along. And I had to get up and explain to these people, you know, that I think we should take that limit off. And I said, this is not like hook and line fishing. This is not catch and release. I said, this spear is made to take that fish out of the lake. I said, we don't want it ripping off, be swimming around and die. I said, we want to take it home. And they voted unanimously, I said, you do it, whatever you think is right, you should go ahead and do it. So we made it, we made it 36 inches. I, I didn't even want it that big, but you don't spear a 36 inch fish and, and walk into a tavern and try to brag about it. So, <laughs> so anyway. So anyway, we've got to change. <laughs> um, if anybody has, we have a few minutes left. If anybody has any questions. Yes. What is the difference in the species between the sturgeon and Russia in contrast to here? Are they also in the rivers in Russia or are they in the seawater? Oh, they're in the Caspian okay. Sea. Okay. That's the sea they live in. They live in the Caspian Sea, and they will spawn in rivers, but the Volga River, 2,000 miles, they could go up this river. And so it was, uh, it's, they solved the problem. They're raising, I, somebody f sent me a paper f from Russia. Trans trans you got it. It's a Russian newspaper. In English, and they were talking about raising. They put in seventy some million, seventy some million sturgeon that they hatch, that they're restocking. And they're restocking all their lakes, whatever, just to raise sturgeon. So, so I'm sorry if we've been talking too long. I was just gonna. I was just gonna add too. In Wisconsin, we have lake sturgeon, and lake sturgeon are what are living in Lake Winnebago. Lake Winnebago is part of the Great Lakes watershed. So. Um, the Lower Fox River connects Lake Winnebago to uh, Green Bay. There are a series of locks and dams on the Lower Fox now that have been there since the 1800s. Yeah. So uh, the Winnebago sturgeon are still connected to the Great Lakes. They can still make it down into the Great Lakes, not so much um, Great Lakes fish coming back up into Winnebago, but uh, talking about those thousands of miles, um, there there have been sturgeon, Winnebago sturgeon, tagged in Lake Erie several times. So they do get out of Winnebago and they go explore. <laughs> well, when the uh, when the lumbering industry was going on, the, sh the boats from the north were trying to bring uh, rafts of logs up to Winnebago. There were uh, sawmills in Oshkosh and Fond du Lac. And so they built 17 locks and dams in the, in the Fox River from, Green, from Lake Winnebago to the Bay of Green Bay, Sturgeon Bay. I always think the name Sturgeon Bay came from when they put these blocks in the river the sturgeon must have migrated in there just the way they did in Russia going up to these and they had a, and they named it Sturgeon Bay that's I that's only my thought but anyway there's 17 locks and dams so go ahead sir question you've described how other states in the United States are getting on the bandwagon with um, uh, local individuals supporting it can you tell us what is going on in Canada? Oh, Canada is, Canada is very active. We're connected by the Great Lakes. And um, Canada and all the Great Lakes, they're, they're doing work on it. They've been down here. They've been, they've been talking to us for a long time. And they're, uh, they were going through the same problem, trying to raise sturgeon, believe me. It was just... A, <coughs> A stroke of luck that we found out how to do it so quickly. So, someone over here. Oh, there, sir. Here. I was watching some commercial fishermen mm -hmm. in Lake Sedona. I was watching some commercial fishermen in the early 80s 
taking a catch. They had a line, uh, a net going across Squaw Bay. And, uh, you know, there's lots of um, carp and some buffalo, which is a gourmet kind of carp, a few game fish. And there's one sturgeon in their haul. Yeah. Uh, it was probably about 40 inches. Yeah. How does a stir? Is that unusual for a sturgeon to be in one of our local lakes? I can talk about that. If you yeah. Um, yeah, they're not they're not native to the Madison Lakes, but uh, in the 20s and the 30s, there was a lot of fish rescue work that went on. Um, in Lake Winnebago, but also a lot in the Mississippi River. So before the, the locks and dams came into the Mississippi, the, the back sloughs in the Mississippi would dry up in the summer, and a lot of the young fish would be trapped back there. So um, different state agencies figured out uh, it was a lot cheaper to send a crew of guys out there to net these young fish and then distribute those fish around the state to other waters instead of spending all this money to raise them in hatcheries. I mean, they were doing that too, but a lot of this fish rescue went on during the 20s and 30s, and um, that's likely where the lake sturgeon got into the, the Madison Lakes. And you do hear stories about them. I was actually just talking to a group um, last week uh, that they were telling me about different sightings as well. Um, there, it's not really known how many are, are around, but uh, scuba divers, especially if they're in Lake Mendota, they've been sighted um, in Lake Monona as well by, um, by the Monona Terrace. So they are out there and they, they could very well be spawning. There's just not much known about them. One more. One more. Yes. Okay, the question I was going to ask was are they spawning naturally now? Are you still raising them, and do you oh. think they will ever be able to sustain a population? Oh, yeah. We don't have a population problem in Winnebago at all. And uh, right now, we're, any fish that we raise are usually put in. Last year, we put 80,000, I think, from Wild Rose. One batch of them went into the Wisconsin River, and they had sturgeon there years ago. And now they'll have them again, and we raise them extra long this year. Normally we'd raise them four or five inches, but now we raise a batch up to 10 to 12. So other fish won't, maybe a muskie or whatever, we want to nail them now. They don't touch these little guys. So So your goal should be not to have to raise them at all. Do you think you can get I'm that? I'm sorry? Your goal should be not to have to raise them at all. Do you think Oh, that yeah. You can well, the idea is that we know how to raise them. Yeah. Should we have a problem? Because, but there's so many people calling. They want them back. They know we had them. They know they had them in their waters and their time. And so that's basically what we're doing. It's just helping people restock their, their waters with them. And there's like, there are people that there are places where you can hook and line a sturgeon. You put a gob of night crawlers on a nice hook and a good spinning rod and whip it out and let it lay on the bottom and you catch sturgeon but there's an absolute size limit on that they have to be like 56 inches i think before you're allowed to take it and there's quite a fine on that if you ever get caught people just love to go catching them and if they get a big one they can take it along but otherwise and you're only allowed one. That's what we are and where I fish in Winnebago. You're allowed one fish a year. When I started, you could raise, you could raise, you could have five. The tag cost twenty dollars now. When I started, they were a nick uh, five cents a piece. You could have five of them. And my dad would give me a, a dime, and he'd say. If you get two, you can stop in the tavern and get another tag. But he said, there's no sense in wasting the money. <laughs> That's, you know, four. Yeah. So, okay. Just into, I would just like to plug the, the sturgeon patrol. If, if you think this sounds like an interesting fish, it is. And a really great way to go see it is, is when the sturgeon are spawning every spring. Um, the Wolf River is their, their main highway for spawning. You can volunteer to uh, serve on the sturgeon patrol. The, the wardens will give you one of these great hats. And then their phone number, and you just kind of stand there 
sit on the bank, watch the fish. They're right there. They're beautiful. They're gigantic, ancient fish. Um, so I, I highly recommend that. And then um, the sturgeon spearing season is every February, too. And, and that's a great time to see just what these fish and this culture is all about. I'd like to, I'd like to um, wrap up by saying we have a couple of the books down here. If you want to flip through them. They're not for sale or anything, but in case you want to see them, we have some here. Um, they are for sale, like in bookstores, but they're, we're not selling them is what I'm saying. And if you would help me thank our two guests. Oh, thank you.